Hi, I am Dr. Sakir Mansoor and today I will discuss with you the swan neck deformity, right? So here the distal interphalangeal giant is in flexion and the proximal interphalangeal giant is in hyperextension. So let's move on. I am uh, in fact started a series of the lectures with the tendon lesions and the finger deformities. I've discussed already these four and this is the last swan neck deformity, the reverse of the botanial deformity. Swan neck deformity is the reverse of the botanial deformity. Proximal interphalangeal giant gets hyperextended and the distal interphalangeal giant gets flexed. I've told you already. This deformity can be voluntarily reproduced by the lax jointed individuals. The shape of the deformity looks similar to a swan's neck. That is how the disease got its name, right? It's like that of a swan neck. This is the clinical appearance in a patient, swan neck deformity. You could see this. What are the causes? The deformity has numerous causes with the two things in common. Number one, imbalance of the extensor versus flexor action at proximal interphalangeal joint. Slackness of palmar plate. Thus, it can occur when proximal interphalangeal extensors overact, for example, due to contracture after mallet finger intrinsic muscle spasm or after volar subluxation of the metacarpophalangeal joint. When the, number two, when proximal interphalangeal flexors are insufficient inhibition or division of the flexor digitorum superficialis. Or number three, when palmar plate of proximal interphalangeal joint fails, intermittent arthritis, trauma, or lex jointed persons. Or it's more causes. Uh, you could see this untreated mallet finger can progress into a swan neck deformity. Rheumatoid arthritis, it is an inflammatory disease that can make the proximal interphalangeal joint to get loosened and hyperextend. Injury, it's another cause. The trauma to the hand may tighten the muscles of the fingers and hand. Another cause is the rupture of the finger tendon, which can lead to the swan neck deformity. And yet another cause is the nerve disorders, diseases like Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy or a stroke may tighten the muscles of the fingers in the hand. And uh, another cause is the misaligned fracture. Any fracture of middle or proximal phalanx can produce one activity if it heals in a misaligned manner. And in the last, the cause is a scleroderma. If deformity is permitted to persist, secondary contraction of the intrinsic muscle and ultimately of proximal interphalangeal giant itself makes rectification progressively difficult and finally it is impossible. So what's the treatment of the swan neck deformity? It depends on its cause and whether or not deformity has gotten fixed. If this deformity can be corrected passively, then a simple figure of a figure of eight ring splint to keep proximal interphalangeal joint in a few degrees of flexion can be all that is needed. If this does good but can't be tolerated, then tenodesis of proxal, proximal interphalangeal joint is a good option. The choices are either to attach one slip of the flexor digitorum superficialis to proximal phalanx, which prevents the hyperextension or to reroute a lateral band anteriorly such that it turns into a flexor extens instead of an extensor of the proximal interphalangeal giant. It's a good technique, this choice. So the treatment continues. If intrinsic and if intrinsics are very tight, they are released. If the deformity gets fixed, then it can respond to mild manipulation added by temporary K-wire fixation in a few degrees of flexion. If not, then release of the lateral band from the center slip will be required. The skin on dorsal aspect may not close directly after the correction. If swan neck deformity follows a mallet finger, mallet finger has already been discussed with you in a, in a separate video, then mallet finger should be addressed as discussed earlier. If function is impaired a lot, and is not responding to one of the above procedures, giant is arthrodized in a rather more acceptable position, right? This, the, the bones are jointed to make a longer bone, arthrodesis. And the staging of the swan neck deformity, very interesting. The nail buff classification system is used to stage 
the classification and uh, the classification system is based on stiffness of the proximal interphalangeal joint associated uh, metacarpophalangeal joint positions. Type 1, the PIP, the proximal interphalangeal joint is flexible in all positions of the metacarpophalangeal joint. Type 2 stating uh, the um, PIP joint flexion is restricted in some position of the metacarpophalangeal joint. Type 3, the proximal interphalangeal joint flexion is restricted irrespective of position of the metacarpophalangeal joint. And in the last stage, stage or the type 4 is the proximal interphalangeal joints get stiff and there is a poor radiographic look. So evaluation, active and passive range of motion are to be assessed at metacarpophalangeal, proximal interphalangeal and distal interphalangeal joints individually, right? These are the three joints with these active and passive ROM is assessed. In addition to manual testing, the patient must be screened for rheumatoid arthritis and x-rays are to be ordered for evaluation of articular disruption as sphere arthritis in later stages or even a carpal collapse. So it's very interesting now, punal littler test to determine if a patient has presented with a capsular restriction or in this intrinsic tightness. A bonal littler test, also known as the phenocytobronal test, is carried out. This test is carried out by holding the metacarpophalangeal joint in an extended position while passively flexing proximal interphalangeal joint, noticing available range of motion. Here you could see this bonal littler test is being performed on that. Yes, I told you already. This is test is then performed again with metacarpophalangeal joint flexed. If no change in motion takes place between two tests, then capsule restriction at proximal interphalangeal joint is proposed if the motion gets increased when metacarpophalangeal joint is flexed. Then tightness of the intrinsic muscle is proposed. I've discussed it with you already, Bruno later test. So in the last a few words about the differential diagnosis involving the swan neck deformity, the Bottinier deformity can be misinterpreted as a swan neck deformity. In fact, they are both a reverse of each other. It is necessary to recognize that the Bottinier deformity involves hyperextension of the distal interphalangeal and flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint. If it is a reverse of the botanier deformity, as I discussed with you. So these five tendinians and the finger deformities are discussed now completed. I will notice um, uh, in, in um, coming lectures, we'll take on to some other very interesting um, uh, videos. So please uh, stay tuned and support my channel if you like it. And goodbye. Thank you very much.